Uh, this is a picture of my observatory. It's a two-run observatory. There's a telescope from to the right, where you see the telescope sticking out. The roof rolls off to the south, which is uh, then unusual. And um, on the left side, there's an equipment room. Okay. We'll now take a look into. It's looking in the main door of the observatory. And uh, power space, computers. Um, this room is heated and insulated, so it's comfortable in the winter. This is looking at the telescope itself. It's a 7 inch uh, astrophysics Starfire refractor. It's on the Astrophysics 800 mount, and that is on a 350 pound steel pier, uh, which uh, goes on the floor, and then below the floor is about 5,000 pounds of reinforced concrete down on the ground. Um, you can see my CCD camera on the tail end of it, where the IP should be, and we'll take a closer look. Okay, over on the right is my CCD camera, and we'll be looking much more close to that in a couple of minutes. Um, there is a second motor focuser, which you see just before the white tube. You can see a big umbilical cable coming great around, and um, that's carrying power, coolant, uh, from the CCD camera and also logic signals. The uh, box on the pier um, uh, has the camera controller in it and also um, has the controller for the mount in it. Um, and uh, I guess it's pretty obvious the appearance is all homemade stuff, except for the telescope. This is under the floor at the north end of the pier. And, uh, uh, what's down there is that there's a coolant pump, I don't have a pointer here, but there's a, <coughs> there's a heat exchanger beside it, which is uh, uh, the focus, you know, not there to pop. Um, which has got a big fan in it, ah, thanks. And, uh, yeah, there we go. There's an air pump that pressurizes the coolant system. Um, there's a power supply to the CCD camera, and you see the cabling and the coolant lines going out to the here. Okay, this is the uh, camera itself. Um, it has at the moment got the eyepiece projection adapter on it, so there's an eyepiece inside here. The light goes into this end. There's a collet here which allows the camera to be taken off of the adapter. There's then a box here, and this is giving you an idea of the size. This is about 8 inches square, this box here. Um, and in there, there's a shutter wheel and a filter wheel. Uh, that's the stepping motor that drives the uh, shutter wheel around. The uh, aluminum boxes have the electronics in them. The CCD chips in the vacuum chamber that's hidden behind here, we'll see that in a few moments. Uh, just for reference, there's a vacuum valve sticking out here, which you'll see in uh, future photographs here. Okay, this is the shutter wheel. It's just a missing sector, um, and it's uh, on a stepping motor, so it just goes around to make the explosion. Of course, the light comes to the hole here, and that there's the collar. This is a filtering wheel, um, which has photometric and other filters on it. And uh, that's the CCD chip right in there. So you're looking into the vacuum chamber here to uh, help the ball in the wheel. Okay, this is the camera with the um, shutter box removed and with the covers off. And uh, that's the window in the vacuum chamber, so the light comes in here. And the CCD chip sitting in there somewhere. And at the back is the coolant jacket, and we'll see why in a couple of moments. And of course, the back of the valve sitting up here. This here is the analog uh, electronics for uh, the video processing and conversion to digital. The other side got all the clocking electronics and the uh, power electronics. Okay, this is looking into the vacuum chamber with the lid off. So you can see the O-ring seal coming around here for the uh, vacuum seal, and. This is not the correct CCD chip. This is a dummy that's in here, but that's where the CCD chip does reside. Um, you can see the leads coming off of each side going to vacuum feed throughs on the walls to go to the outside world where the electronics are. And down here, there's the connections to the thermal electric coolers, which cool this down. What we're operating the CCD chips at minus 72 degrees Celsius. So I'll take this apart a further. That over there is about one and a half inches square, and that's the large thermal electric cooler, which uh, sits um, against the cooling jack in the bottom of that chamber we saw a moment ago. 
This thing here sits on top of that, and in the middle there sits this stack, which has got three thermoelectric coolers uh, stacked in stages on top. And the CCD chip goes right on top here. Okay, this is the socket for the CCD chip, and uh, it's a bit complex. There's a fair amount of wiring in here and so on. Um, this, is, uh, this is quite small. I think it's uh, 0.7 inches across here. That's uh, one of the CCD chips I use. Uh, this is in centimeters down here, so you get an idea of the size of it. This one has a window on it, a um, glass window. The one I actually use in the camera has no window on it. So if you make one little slip, you destroy the chip. Okay, this is uh, in the warm room, and this is uh, uh, a perfectly normal PC computer here. It's a 486DX266 with 20 megabytes of memory on it, um, and a special interface for the camera. This here is the controller for the thermoelectric coolers. Uh, that's the garbage bag for the results. <laughs> Okay, this is the uh, vacuum system that's used to evacuate the camera. Um, that's a pop gauge. Uh, well, that's the pump there itself. It's not obvious to everyone. The pump gauge for measuring the vacuum. And then down here is the camera actually sitting on the pump being evacuated. Okay, these are a, a few numbers. Um, these slides are another talk, but uh, they should serve here. Uh, give you some idea about the observatory numerically. I know where it is quite accurately. The sky's quite bright. A dark sky is a 20 second magnitude per Earth, that's uh, where I say, roughly. And it's uh, 170 over here at 9.4. I normally use it with a 2 times Barlow uh, to uh, get um, the right image scale. And the optics are reasonably good even in the near infrared, which is luck. That's not necessarily to be expected. Um, that was partially computer control. Uh, computer control focusing, uh, one of my major problems is that my focus drifts up to a millimeter due to temperature changes, and I have not successfully modeled that. Um, the drive is now plus minus three R seconds after some modifications, and I don't guide at all. I'm lazy. Okay, some information about the camera itself. It's 576 pixels east west and 384 north south. Um, with a 2 times bar, it was 1.38 yard seconds each pixel, 13.22 by 8.88 yard minutes, and uh, the CCD chip of the Thompson um, CSF T7883. Cosmetically, it's uh, almost completely clean. 14 bit AD conversion, and gain of 6 electrons per AD for those who care, 19 electrons read out otherwise. Uh, the dark current is reasonably low for an amateur camera. 0.15 electrons per second per pixel. And the CCD temperature, I said it was minus 72 degrees, and it's stable at about 0 0.05 degrees. It's quite well regulated. I have nearly a zero bias frame. Um, electronics is stable. Uh, camera saturates about 100,000 electrons per pixel. Um, I have both by filling noise. I have an accurate microstep rotating shutter, um, sector shutter. The shutter I showed you actually is quite accurate, even if it's quite short exposures. Um, I produce compressed bits image files, which are the um, astronomical standard for images, uh, so I can send my images to other places. And they're quite extensively documented automatically in the headers. I have a set of BPRI filters, these are photometric filters, which are computed to match the CCD chip. Okay. Now, off to uh, a few pictures. Um, after I he showed a uh, picture of mine this morning, I figured I had to show you what it really looks like. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's the EAD 142 right up in there. And this thing is an IC 1396. Okay, there's a bar which most people recognize. So this, is, this is just give a few examples uh, in more tangible terms of the system. 
And this is has to be a supernova remnant. That's N82. And uh, that's NGC 206, which is in M31. This was quite a surprise to me when I first took this picture. Um, I didn't realize with my Hipsquid telescope, I knew that was all starred in the galaxy. That was, that was not expected. And that's my only color picture I've ever done, and it's M27. Um, <coughs> And that's uh, Shoemaker Lee 9. You can see about five or six new that I have there. That was pretty much it. Should the flag be projected by Sky Telescope and Sun? Okay. Now, I don't know if I can do this with this. Rapidly, often in one night, which we'll see a little bit later here. 
Um, the suspicion is the Quasar spin axis is pointed at us, uh, which increases the variation. Um, the energetic air uh, portion of this thing has to be small in our solar system because to get variation one night, unless we happen to be in a very special location, um, if the size has to be small and the time it takes for light to travel across it when you see the variations. So this must be an extremely energetic thing because the redshift is 0 0.306. So it's something like 3 billion light years away from us. This thing has an outburst about every 12 years. And the consortium was formed, the, the consortium was formed to observe the outburst produced in 1994. There's around 40 professional astronomers in the consortium. Okay, the uh, fins that are leading the consortium um, have studied OJ-27 for decades. Um, they proposed a model for the system, and this was the uh, main impetus behind the OJ-94 project, was to see if this model was correct or not. Um, there was an organizational conference in the summer of 1993, and then observations right from radio right through the gamma rays um, have been taken from fall of 93, and it looks like we're going to the end of 95 at the moment. There was a conference in the summer of 94, which um, was looking at data gathering, data analysis, um, only part of the data was in, of course, at that point, from the observations, a lot of it was unprocessed. There's a conference this fall, um, again, we're going to look at the data analysis, but much more detailed analysis of the data, and some preliminary model fitting will be, I think, presented at the conference. Um, there are many papers in the process being published in the project already, showing the basic data and um, initial analysis of the data. And they are planning an open conference um, on Blazars in 1996 um, to finish this off. Okay, now it's my observatory related to this project. Uh, OJ-94 was uh, found on Usenet by Rolf Meyer, and he was kind to point this out to me, got me uh, involved in spending two years of my life. <laughs> um, I've been doing VRI photometry. Uh, my being, unfortunately, is not sensitive enough. I'm much less a quantum efficient in blue than I am in the other past bands. I've taken about 30,000 two-minute exposures um, of OJ-27 and another quasar called PC-66A. Um, these have all been reduced to differential photometry. Um, all of my efforts have been placed towards producing this data as accurately as possible. Um, because that's what the OG94 project needs. This is the main contribution the amateur I can make. Um, I have the telescope time that they haven't got. Um, so I can provide the, uh, I can fill in all the gaps when they don't have large telescope time. Um, so, and it's taken a large amount of effort to get reasonable data on this faint and object with a 7 telescope. So I've been doing that while I'm studying astrophysics about um, this object. I hope to learn a bit of that when I go in September to uh, this conference. But um, don't ask me any questions about exactly how this uh, object works with the theories because I haven't had time to even look at them. Um, I did attend the 1994 conference in Finland and I will go in 1995 in the UK. And if Spain will allow me in, I will go in 96. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I would like to just show the um, Last slide that's uh, in the projector there. It's still on? Yeah. Okay, this is just so you can um, place it. OJ287 is in the circle. It just looks like another star. But I have uh, maybe 29,000 images that look just like that. So it's really, really exciting to come to my observatory and watch my observation. <laughs> Go back to the projector. Okay, show a bit of the data here. This was presented at the conference last summer. And um, this is uh, data microwave bands and coming up through the far infrared, up into the infra near infrared, then into the red, visual, blue, and ultraviolet. This is for OJ-287. And this is the, all the data from the entire consortium that's shown here. 
uh, if we'll dot at the data point. Um, one of our main problems with this project is how to represent this data. Um, the moment you put any error bars on this stuff, which of course really should be there, you can't see anything. Um, even here, there's a lot of information you actually can't see because it's all one on top of another. Um, we haven't come up with a good way of visualizing this stuff. All we can really do is look at blown blood details, which I'll show you in a moment, and uh, do computer processing on this stuff. There's also uh, polarization data, spectra, gamma ray data, and far UV data at that time as well. Okay, now. This is my data um, for the two years. We're missing about one month on the end here, the last month um, this year, well, just before now. Um, and uh, let's see, let's see it on here. I'll move it over in a moment. The top curve is the I curve. The middle curve is red. And the bottom curve is the visual. And each little dot on here is an observation. Uh, so it, it represents about 40 minutes of time, um, of uh, calendar time, and uh, uh, an exposure of about a third of that. And so you can see it definitely does vary. Um, the uh, vertical um, line of the points is not all due to errors. So the amount of actual variation in one night. Okay, now this is a, um, a detailed look. These are Julian Day's law on the bottom here, and this is just a few days of data. And the error bars, every one of the points, in fact, has an error bar on it. This is so small on, uh, this, these were some very good nights. Um, the error bars are so small, you can barely see them on many points here, but you can see a few uh, bad points which have got by the error bars. Anyway, here you can definitely see that there's uh, trends during the night. Trends up like this, and then um, so the thing really does vary quite rapidly. Okay, just a brief talk here about discoveries. It's too soon on this project for most discoveries that might happen. Um, some things are known at this point. I do know some things that are not been published and I can't talk about yet. Um, but um, the full database is not yet available for proper analysis. Um, some of it hasn't been received by the people archiving the data, and some of the data is preliminary. Mine right now is preliminary. I still haven't finished the final transformation and things like that on all of my data. Um, I was working on it just before I came. And they also, even, all this, even, even though all this data is supposedly standardized, um, it turns out that if you do, uh, if you analyze one group's data versus another one on the same nights, same times, they do not overlay each other, and correction factors have to be worked out in order to homogenize all the data um, before you can use the entire data set as one consistent data set. Okay, one thing I discovered, this is a personal discovery, is uh, early on in the game I discovered these large nightly variations. And observing one set of points a night. And once I made that discovery, I started observing every night, all night, when it's clear. I got about 90% covered for the last two years doing that. Um, and that data then permitted other people to analyze short term variations, excuse me, um, in OJ27. And they showed that the variations in magnitude, that is, logarithmic scale, were larger than when the object is brighter. So, any uh, questions? Yeah, I guess I should find the lights. And I'm blind for it. There. There. What are the actual products of the air bars? Oh, well, the ones I showed you there um, would be like uh, 0.02, magnitude or something. Um, but that was a very good set of nights. Uh, that was very carefully selected uh, transparency. They go all over the place. I, uh, I, I follow the policy of observing. If I can find out you guys observed it, no matter how bad things were, 
um, on the basis that that might be the night something happened, and I might have been the only one looking. For a lot of this time, I was the only one looking at this object. Um, so I observed it whenever it was possible. So then the air bar is about 0.3 magnitude of some nights. <coughs> Have you modified your setup after uh, taking on this project in any way? Uh, Software-wise, there's been considerable modification to uh, make it possible to do uh, proper photometric reductions. Um, uh, for the first 12,000 images, I, I, I reduced all those by hand. Um, I mean, with, with a mouse on screen because I didn't have the uh, point spread fitting uh, uh, automatic software to do it. I had the right design to write that. Um, hardware wise, I guess the main modifications were to make the system keep working continuously. I mean, the, the coldest night I observed was minus 37 Celsius. Um, and uh, there were a lot of things that failed at about minus 22. <laughs> and, um, there was one night where I had 1,000 watt heaters sitting under the equipment and, and so on. Uh, fortunately, it was at the right end of the telescope, so the scene was all right. But um, uh, I then had to do a bunch of modifications at, you know, uh, at these cold temperatures in order to keep the electronics running. Uh, I don't think there's anything else that was specifically done uh, once I started OJ94. Next question. There? I was going to ask you. Did it meet the predictions? Yeah. Um, that, uh, okay, we don't by any means have a full answer on that. Um, uh, I guess I can tell you that, um, the, that the model makers uh, are running around in joy preparing some papers. Um, and uh, they have said that there will be an outburst in November this year, or the model's dead. And the project was supposed to terminate this summer. It was supposed to be finished now. I, I was going to tear my observatory apart right now, and I'm told not to. Um, and so uh, at the end of November, we will, we will know. <laughs> oh, actually, what really happens, they'll probably make another prediction. But, uh, okay. Yeah. Just curious what difficulties. Oh, uh, the last of things move. <laughs> so when they move, they go past faint stars, and it fouls up the photometry. I mean, when I talk about light curves, I mean, the, the first one I tried was a 17th magnitude or asteroid that somebody asked me to. came to me and said, I've got this 10th magnitude asteroid that somebody's made that me. And I said, oh, well, that's no problem. Yeah. Well, then I found out it was not 10th, okay, it was 17th. And um, that turned out to be rather difficult. I think it still can be done, but it will be necessary to model the sky background behind it. It's necessary to have an image uh, when the asteroid isn't there, and then subtract that from all the images with the asteroid there in order to remove the um, uh, interference. Um, and uh, it's not just the, I mean, the stars fall the sky estimates. It's, I mean, this is right at the margin. If this were not a moving object, this would be a marginal capability um, to also make a moving object. <laughs> yeah? How many gigabytes of gigabytes represent all the pictures you have accumulated so far? Oh, um, as many gigabytes. Um, each, each raw image is, I compress them. And they take about 150 k bytes a piece. And uh, my current, uh, I have an image numbering scheme, and all my images are in a database. And number, I'm up at 54,000 something right now. So there's 54,000 times 150 k bytes approximately, whatever that comes out to. It's a fair pile of tapes anyway. Next. Back. Only your uh, picture that you showed is Exposure times would you be using for your for your, both the images that you showed us and also the OJ two eighty seven images? 
Well, the, excuse me. <coughs> should have the last one. Um, the OJA images, um, they're all done as uh, two minute raw exposures, but um, I do a series of, uh, it's right here, uh, uh, eight Vs. Well, okay, I do V R I V, that pattern, and I do it four times to form a block. And uh, so I guess there's eight Vs in there, so there's 16 minutes of V and eight minutes of R and eight minutes of I. Uh, I can't remember which color that picture was that was up there, but it would have been um, one of those numbers. Now, the uh, deep sky pictures, uh, one thing I learned doing astrophotography. I can find an image in seconds, I can find these objects in seconds, I can take a picture in seconds, the object's there, you can see it. But, it's very noisy. And if you go and take a multi-hour image, it becomes a nice, you know, much less noisy picture. Um, so, let me try to give you some examples of finding this list here. Yeah, B33, um, that image was 5,800 seconds. And, um, the Cas A was 16,000 seconds. And uh, the BBB 142 was 33,000 seconds. Sorry, I don't have that in minutes here. Um, what else have I show you? There's, uh, if I find the NGC 206. Yeah, the NGC 206 was 5,800 seconds. That was actually uh, a red and infrared image. There was, uh, there was a filter in there that cut out everything else. I think the rest of them were barefoot. Just a straight CC response. Any other questions? I guess I've got That's it.